Hi everyone, this is Andy. Welcome to Med School EU. And in today's video, we are going to do our second part of uh, the topic called the animal tissues. And of course, we won't be able to cover every single thing about animal tissues because we could write an entire course on it. However, today we're just going to go over some of the most important details that you should know for the IMAT exam. In the last video, we left off with uh, the connective tissue. We did not discuss blood as part of connective tissue because that will be in the unit of um, physiological systems where when we're going to talk about the uh, circulatory system that we have uh, in humans and we're going to discuss blood as a type of connective tissue in uh, great detail. So I left that part out. Now moving on to the next type of tissue and that's going to be muscle tissue. That's the third tissue that we're studying in this animal tissue unit. So here um, we begin with a diagram that's just going to highlight everything that we need to know about muscle tissue for this exam. So we must recognize that there's three types of muscle tissue. They're not all the same. Each one has different features and different functionalities. So we're going to discuss each one. So skeletal muscle is our typical muscle that we would assume um, would be on, on the arm, on the leg. It's just muscle that is, uh, the function of it is locomotion. The function is to move and it is voluntary. So it's, the function is locomotion, locomotion or movement, movement of limbs, movement of body parts, and it is completely voluntary. And what I mean by voluntary is that we can control everything consciously. Now the structure of it is that it is striated, striated, meaning that they have these little um, striations, they have these little lines that are all parallel. Another important thing to know about skeletal muscle is the notion of syncytium. And I'm going to explain what that is. It's called syncytium. Syncytium uh, basically means that each cell or each cellular unit, which would be the muscle fiber, contains multiple nuclei. As you can see these little dots here, there is multiple of these nuclei on each cell. And of course, they're, as you can see here, they're usually attached to the skeleton. Of course, that would transform into the tendon and then the tendon would attach into uh, the bone. Now, the next one on the list here, we got smooth muscle and it's uh, showing the uh, our digestive tract. And the reason for that is because smooth muscle exists all over the digestive tract. Pretty much the entire lining of the digestive tract is uh, smooth muscle tissue. It is what uh, does something called peristalsis. That is uh, something that pushes the food down in the same direction and prevents it from coming back up. And coming back up is something called regurgitation. And the function of peristalsis, peristalsis is done by the smooth muscles. They, are, they exist in the digestive tract. Uh, smooth muscles also exist on blood vessels. So uh, blood vessels like arterioles are arterioles they have a smooth muscle that are able to constrict or dilate depending on the blood pressure now another important thing to note is they differ in the way they look they're non striated so we can write here non striated like the skeletal muscle these muscles act in voluntary meaning that we do not have to think of our digestive system contracting smooth muscles. That happens automatically based on our reflexes. So if there's food traveling down the digestive tract, the nervous system knows to innervate those muscles, those smooth muscles in the digestive tract to, pu to push the food down. And the last type of muscle tissue that we have on the list here is called the cardiac muscle. And cardiac muscle is, of course, just a heart muscle. It's a specialized type of tissue. 
or a specialist type of um, muscle tissue that only exists in the heart. And it's special because it is uh, arranged differently. It is striated. However, it only has single uh, nuclei. Cardiac muscle is also involuntary. Again, of course, we don't have to think of each heartbeat that we need to make. That happens automatically. And this only exists in the heart and nowhere else in the body. And the, these are kind of the histology. Uh, these are the images that you would see under the light microscope. Please make sure you remember these main features of each so you can distinguish them when it comes to an exam question. So now, uh, next, we are going to label our muscle fiber. So this is just a classification of muscle fibers and uh, how uh, th the structure that they form. So first, we're going to start with the big and work our way down to the small. This outer lining of our muscle, our entire muscle, the mass, the bulk of the muscle, is called epimesium. Now these little dots right here that are inside the uh, muscle or, or all these muscle fibers, that's, that's our blood vessels. So that's the vessels. They could be uh, arteries, they could be arterioles or, or veins. Now uh, going um, further inside, so underneath the epimesium, we got something called perimesium. So that, that would be the label right here. It's called peri. Mesium. And the, in, the more inner lining that lines all of these fascicles, all of these bundles here, that's called the endomesium. And, and these are basically just fascia. They're, they're just tissue that kind of lines around and keeps everything intact. Now this entire structure, this, this whole thing here, all of these, all of these uh, bundles, they're called fascicles. So I'm going to label a different color here. We got fascicles. That's a fascicle. And inside the fascicle, we are going to have something called a muscle fiber. So these, of course, are broken down into uh, more, into smaller fibers. But the the general unit of a muscle, so the most simplest unit of a muscle that is able to perform a function is called a muscle fiber. Muscle fiber. So each of these uh, little things that's part of the bundle, these are all muscle fibers and they're composed of even smaller parts that are uh, non-significant for this lecture. However, it's important to know all of these little things are muscle fibers. They are the basic unit of muscle tissue. This is the unit that can perform its function at its uh, smallest capacity. So if you go any, any smaller to these uh, little striations, they would not be able to perform the function fully. However, a muscle fiber on its own is able to perform the function therefore it's classified as its most basic unit in other words muscle fibers are cells muscle cells that's the muscle cell that is represented next uh, this is a, a diagram that uh, also you should memorize but before we before you just jump in and memorize you should probably understand because if you understand the three types of um, muscle fibers that we have it would, it's going to be very easy to memorize and, uh, and be able to understand this information that's given here. So we have three different types of muscle fibers. There are fast twitch and there are slow twitch and there's intermediate. So type one is con contraction time is slow right here. Type one is slow twitch oxidative fiber. Type 2A is uh, it's labeled as fast, so it's intermediate. It's somewhere in between the fast and the slow. And type 2X is the very fast. So this is um, a fiber that is able to, you know, the, the quick, the fast twitch fibers. So for example, the muscles in our, in our fingers, the muscles in our eyes, our eye muscles are able to move very quickly 
and uh, very precisely, those muscles are fast twitch, they're type 2X. However, the muscles in our legs, especially our thighs or, or the buttocks, those muscles are type 1 because they're slow twitch muscles. So each one has its own advantages and disadvantages. And you might imagine how they work now knowing how uh, each one is able to twitch. And actually every human has a different um, percentage of each. So f this is why you would see a difference in athletes where one athlete could run faster than the other even though they could be on the same diet, the same training program, they could have the same statistics but one simply runs faster than the other and you know people call that talent however scientifically speaking that's just because they were born with genetic advantage over their playing field so for example somebody like Usain Bolt has many 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 more fast twitch muscle fibers where he's able to twitch faster and run faster and um, his the, the leg muscles on the thighs and the buttocks that are able to uh, increase his speed he has a higher number of those so the percentage of fast twitch outweighs his percentage of slow twitch muscle however Usain Bolt would not be able to outrun a marathon runner in a marathon and why is that because he has a lower no matter how much he trains, no matter how much he's going to train for the marathon, if he is going to run against the best marathon runner in history, just like he is the best uh, sprinter in history, he is going to be outclassed. And that's because the runner that is, uh, that is running um, the marathon will have a higher number of type 1 fibers. That would be the slow twitch. Now, the advantage with the slow twitch fibers is that they have a high oxidative capacity. And oxidative capacity means they use plenty of mitochondria. Mitochondria. So oxidative comes from the word oxygen. And it has a high uh, capacity to use oxygen, meaning that it's un going to undergo aerobic respiration now of course if you are using fast twitch you're going to use much less aerobic respiration why because aerobic respiration does not kick in until later stages until about three five ten minutes onwards that's when aerobic respiration kicks in and that's when the muscles start to use um, ATP and the energy produced by the mitochondria, it takes a little bit of time for that to kick in. But the initial contractions are not going to be using the energy from mitochondria. Initial contractions will be using energy from glucose that is stored inside the cell that is ready to go glucose and one other source that we're going to discuss. However, you, you must understand that the reason that type 1 fibers are able to uh, contract slow, however, they're able, the, the fatigue, the resistance to fatigue is very high, so they fatigue slowly. Why? Because they have plenty of energy reserves with the number of mitochondria. They actually have a higher number of mitochondria within their cells and a higher number of capillaries around them delivering oxygen versus the type 2 fibers. And again, uh, I guess the only thing that you would have to, once you understand type 1 and type 2X, the only thing that you would have to really memorize is the intermediate type 2A, because um, for some capacities, it's going to be uh, just like type 1. For example, with oxidative, it's going to have a high capacity just like type 1. Uh, however, their diameter is going to be something in between. And the resistance to fatigue is something in between. So there's there's different changes in between. Uh, however, it's it's pretty typical to simply memorize that type one is slow, type two is fast, type a, type two a is the intermediate. And based on that observation, you can conclude what type of features they have within those cells in terms of mitochondria, the number of mitochondria, the resistance to fatigue, their generational force. 
further on in our course, we are going to go into great detail about muscle contraction. This is not something that I wanted to talk about in this lecture. However, it is coming up once we start talking about systems. So um, we're not done with the muscle uh, system. That was just an introduction into our muscle tissues and some of the basic things you need to know before we dive into the actual physiology and the anatomy of the human body. So next, I'm going to give you a brief introduction of the nervous system, and that's our last type of tissue that we will discuss. So um, the basic unit of the nervous system is the neuron, right? So um, this is self-explanatory that this is the neuron, and that's the basic unit. That's, that's a cell. This is just one single cell. Uh, that is the neuron and that's the most basic unit of the nervous system so we already have plenty of the labels here and the reason i uh, did not take them off is because we will discuss each of these in great detail and all of their functions however i'm just giving you a quick overview of what they are and what the nervous system and the neuron entails so these uh, little projections here that are around the cell body are called dendrites they uh, receive a signal either from another neuron or from the environment so depending on whether or not this is a sensory neuron or a motor neuron or an inner neuron the dendrites will uh, be able to uh, receive responses and uh, transmit electrical impulses now each um, neuron has a nucleus some nucleuses are located in different parts of the neuron However, this one, this seems to be like a motor neuron. This looks like a motor neuron. Motor neuron meaning that it innervates muscle. It innervates motion. That's why it's called motor neuron. So this neuron, uh, this is just a typical depiction of a neuron where it has the nucleus within its cell body, dendrites sticking out. Now this uh, elongated part, this part right here, uh, from here all the way to there, is called the axon. Axon is this elongated part that would carry it from one place to another. And these could be uh, very long. They could be very short. Uh, however, um, the importance is that it's going to transmit the impulse that the dendrites receive. And it's going to carry that impulse along all the way over to the axon terminals. And these terminals would connect to you know, other dendrites that would be passed on to the next neuron, or it would be connected to a muscle cell, the muscle fiber, and it would be able to innervate it. So that's the way uh, the neuron works. That's just the basic depiction of it. Now, don't worry about these Schwann cells, myelin myelinated sheath, and the node of Ranvier. This is something that we're going to discuss in great detail. Uh, in our nervous system lectures. However, I just wanted to give you a brief uh, overview of the neuron and the most basic part of uh, the most basic unit, which is a, a cell of the nervous system. And here is another image of how the electrical impulses would be transferred over and down the axon. As you can see, this axon uh, does not have these Schwann cells in this myelin myelinated sheath. And these uh, Schwann cells in myelinated sheath actually just uh, speeds up the transmission. It increases the speed of the signal that's being transmitted. And the ones that are naked like this without the Schwann cells, they, um, they're not going to be insulated and the transmission will be much slower. That's just the only thing that I'm showing here. However, this is typically how what they look like. They're just these bundles that transmit electrical impulses inside our body that is able to connect between our brain, our spinal cord, and the rest of the body that is going to be giving reflexes, it's going to be giving commands, it's going to have the autonomic nervous system. Everything happens, everything that happens within our bodies, the reason we're alive is because of the impulses, the electrical impulses of the nervous system and they're transmitted in this sort of fashion. 
Now, before we end this introduction with the nervous system, I wanted to point out that there's three different, uh, major different uh, types of uh, neurons. So, as I mentioned, the neuron is uh, just the basic uh, unit of the nervous system. It's the cell. However, there are three different types. There's the motor neuron, motor sensory, and interneuron. Now, inner neurons are only found in the central nervous system. They're only found in the spinal cord and the brain. They're not going to be found anywhere in the periphery uh, outside the, uh, the central nervous system. They're only gonna be found in the spine and, or, or the spinal cord and the brain. Now, the sensory and the motor neurons are gonna be primarily found in the periphery. The sensory uh, neurons are going to transmit the signal from external environment over to the central nervous system. And the central nervous system will give commands that will be transmitted over by the motor neuron. And the motor neuron will then innervate whichever part of the body that is needed in order to create that response. Now, I wanted to explain another concept about the nervous system because there are three different types of uh, neurons. There is the sensory, motor, and inner neuron. And I'm going to show you the, a depiction, basically an example of a reflex, because this, some, this is something that um, comes up on the exam as well. I'm going to show you an example of a reflex mechanism that we have in our bodies. And this will teach you how uh, it uh, innervates our, the, the three types of uh, neurons. So first, uh, for example, if we have our hand on the hot stove, we are going to have a reflex where we pull that hand off the hot stove much faster than we consciously realize that the stove was hot. Now, the reason why that happens is because of something called a reflex and how it works is that we have a sensory neuron, right? So starting with the sensory neuron that is found on your hand, or, or, or there's gonna be uh, those Merkel cells that will sense on, on your epidermis, which will stimulate a signal to your sensory neuron that's on your hand. And that signal will travel to the spine. There will be two signals, one to the spine and one to the brain. There is a reason why I drew this one to the brain uh, being longer. So one to the spine, one to the brain. Now in the spine, we are going to have uh, inner neuron. So this is another type of neuron. So over here, we got inter neuron. And of course, in the brain, we also have inter neuron and that will be the bridge the connection between the sensory neuron so here i'll just write down sensory that will be the bridge between the sensory neuron and the motor neuron so now from here from the spine we are automatically going to get an innervation of a motor neuron And this motor neuron would be your bicep muscle, for example, and your deltoid muscle that will pull the hand away from the stove. Now, while this mechanism that's right here is happening, while this whole thing here is happening, and it's already happened, it's complete, our brain or, or our signal, our sensory signal finally reaches the brain because this takes longer time uh, to reach the brain and then the inner neuron and then of course it could reach the motor neuron now why I'm explaining this is because it's important to know that there's two signals that go one is going to the spine and one that's going to be transmitted over to the brain both signals happen however the reason why we pull our arm away because it's due to a reflex, it's not going to be from a command from, a, from the brain, it's going to be a command from our spine, 
our spinal cord. And our spinal cord exhibits all kinds of reflexes uh, that help us survive. Uh, these reflexes help us uh, prevent us from falling, for example, because you're not going to realize with your brain what happened by the time you interpret what happened, what kind of sensory stimuli you have. And by the time you innervate that motor neuron, it's going to take way too long. So that's why we have these reflexes to help us survive danger and help us survive uh, different uh, situations because we will have a automatic reflex where if something is triggered that sensory stimulus will travel to the spine and respond with the motor neuron much faster than we would even realize. So I hope this gives you a nice clear introduction on the animal tissues before we dive into our next topic which is called anatomy and physiology of systems in humans and their interactions. This one is going to be a very long topic and we're going to discuss this in many different parts, many different videos. So stay tuned and I'll talk to you soon.